Welcome to the final episode of Breaking the Glass Ceiling, Season 1. Each month in this series, an incredible, strong, and accomplished guest will be sharing lessons learned through their life experiences and careers. Attendees will hear firsthand accounts of moments of triumph, failure, opportunities, and challenges from the people who lived through them, persevered, and emerged successful. Incorporating these perspectives into your own career development strategy can be a great way to build your unique pathway forward. Each session is recorded and will be posted on NIWA's YouTube page following the event. All attendees are uh, already automatically muted and we ask that you turn your camera off and keep yourself muted until the end when we invite you to turn your camera on so we can all see each other. If you have questions that you'd like presented during the question and answer portion, please type them into the Zoom chat or if you're on Facebook, type them into the comments and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. All attendees will receive a quick survey following the webinar. We appreciate your feedback so we can create content, educational and networking programs that are designed to meet our members' needs and wants. The views and opinions expressed during this program are those of the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of NIWA, NIWA Board of Directors, Purdue University Northwest, or other entities that may be associated with today's production. NIWA is the leading group in our region for the professional development of women in their careers. Our mission focuses on providing opportunities for professional growth through networking, leadership support, and education in a variety of industries. Together, we're continuing the advancement of women by bringing together the region's most successful professionals in all areas of business, industry, and community service. For more information on joining NIWA, please go to NWIIWA. Our NIWA events wouldn't be possible without our amazing partners. We appreciate your support and your investment in the development of women here in Northwest Indiana. Our elite uh, partners are Franciscan Health and Ivy Tech. Our premier partner is Horizon Bank and our diamond partner is Sage Popovich. For more information on partnerships with NIWA, please go to nwiiwa.org. Today, we're excited to have our partners and the founders of the Breaking the Glass Ceiling annual event, Dr. Karen Bishop Morris and Dr. Lori Feldman of Purdue Northwest, who will be facilitating today. With that, I'll pass it off to you, Karen and Lori. Thank you so much. And um, I am delighted. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and thank you, Stephanie. We're delighted to be here today. Um, I want to take one quick moment to share with you a little bit more about me. Um, yes, certainly I'm a professor of marketing, but um, I like to tell people that I'm an impact creator and I'm an identifier and nurturer of talent. And that'll come back up in our conversation later um, relating to Debbie's important roles um, in the community. And I wanted to take a quick second to tell you about Breaking the Glass Ceiling. This is a program that Karen and I have been working on for quite a long time to highlight, as um, Alicia mentioned, highlight amazing women in our community and hold them up as examples for all of us and inspiration for us as we all continue to be the amazing women we are. Um, and so let me turn this over at this point to Karen um, for, to, so, she so she can introduce herself and of course our guest of honor, Debbie Coble. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you to all of our wonderful guests and attendees and of course, our, our rock star and featured guest, Debbie Coble. Um, I like to think of myself, uh, in addition to my day job, as a storyteller and fundraising strategist. And it has been so amazing to be on this journey with Lori uh, for eight years and counting. Today, we're here to celebrate the, the life and the work of Debbie Coble. As president and CEO, Debbie is responsible for the oversight and growth of Goodwill Industries of Michiana, Inc. Debbie has had a long and storied career with Goodwill that you will hear more about in just a minute. She holds a BA in Business Management from Anderson University. She holds a Master's from the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University in Human Services, as well as certifications in Executive Leadership from the University of Notre Dame and from Goodwill. 
You can read more about Debbie's expanded bio on the NIWA website, but for now, we want to launch into this conversation. And so we invite you to lean in, to listen and learn as we connect with our region's own, Debbie Koble. Debbie, Lori and I are so delighted to speak with you again. And today in this setting, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. So Debbie, we're going to get right in. And, and we've titled this first segment, as you know, kind of the road to the top. You are a pillar in the community and respected widely for your contributions to Goodwill and its mission now. But the road to the top, as we know, is rarely smooth. So we want you to start by taking us back to the beginning. Did you always see yourself in a C-suite role? What was your first job out of college? Or to say another way, how does a girl from venture end up <laughs> as the president and CEO of Goodwill. And if folks don't catch the reference, Venture was like, you know, Target from the late 70s, 80s. I remember Venture. <laughs> but Debbie, talk to us. Take us back to the beginning. Sure. So, yeah, so that kind of dates us all for those of us who do remember Venture, right? Um, so, to so answer your first question, did I ever imagine myself being in the C suite? Absolutely not. If anybody would have told me when I was leaving college that this is where I was going to be, I would have laughed. Although I do have to tell you, I had a professor who looked at me one day and asked me how I expected to care for my family and hold a position, high position in a company. Boy, would I love to go back and talk to him today. But right out of college, I started at Venture and I was an assistant customer service manager was then promoted into the customer service manager role. And I actually had my store manager elevate me into an opportunity for advanced training. I went for the interview and for those who know me, this is gonna be so shocking. I didn't get it because I was too quiet. I've grown over the years and that's not the case anymore. <laughs> but venture wasn't my style. I got yelled at. I was told to make decisions, you know, by which way I was going to get yelled at the least. And that is not my style. And so I decided I was going to go make all the money in the world by being a financial planner. Had my Series 6 license, had my life insurance license, could not sell a plan to save my soul. So before they realized how bad I was at it, I started looking. <laughs> And I had a couple of folks at church who worked for Goodwill. They had a store manager's position open. And so I said, why not? And so I applied. Um, I was the first store manager with a degree that was hired for Goodwill. And my intent was to stick around a year. And so, you know, I often say through divine intervention, that's how I got to Goodwill was this networking at church and, and the referral into it. And that one year has been 31 years um, and here we still are, so. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for that transparency. So Debbie, you've had this, as you just said, this amazing 31 year career at Goodwill. Um, we know 17 years in a vice president's role before becoming the CEO in 2013. So again, a long time in the CEO role, but before we get into the details of your ascension, to the C-suite through uh, Goodwill. It might be helpful uh, for all of us here today to hear from you as the senior leader um, exactly what the mission of Goodwill and the operational model of Goodwill is because I'm gonna venture to guess like me before we had our conversation, many folks probably are only familiar with the ubiquitous stores and Maybe you can share a little bit more about Goodwill's real impact on the community here in Northwest Indiana and elsewhere. Absolutely. And we talk about, you know, Goodwill, we are more than a store. And our store plays such a vital role because it helps us fulfill our mission, both by providing opportunities for individuals, but also it is a major funding stream for us. If we're going to teach people to be self-sufficient, we need to be self-sufficient ourselves, correct? So the mission of Goodwill is about strengthening communities by empowering individuals and families through education, job training, and job placement. 
And as we have grown, especially over the past seven years, we have become almost a cradle to grave ser service organization, if you would. We have educational programs that focus in on infants, one being our nurse family partnership, where we work with first time moms while they're pregnant and the kids excel while we're working with the little ones while parents are getting educated because we have high schools. We have high schools for adults. We have tech step where we're providing hard skills training. We also provide um, job placement assistance to help folks move into those roles where they can earn wages where they're going to be able to care for them themselves and their families through the most abundant living possible. You know, Debbie, I, that is awesome. And I, I think, again, like me, many people might not have known that. And I know when we talked earlier, you talked about a particular couple who completed the Bridges of Poverty program um, and has had some really amazing success. And it, it for me, it humanized what Goodwill does. Would you mind sharing that story? Absolutely. So you saw a picture of them in the opening segment. It was the young couple standing in front of a house. And that is Richard and Leslie. And Richard came to us um, through our normal process, but he had been having troubles keeping jobs and finding what he really wanted to do. Leslie came through our second chance program. Through drug addiction, um, she spent time in prison. And when she came out, she was referred to us. And we just happened to be opening our granite operation during that time where we repurposed granite. And so Leslie is still after five years in that department um, as kind of our lead granite person. But that couple, they met at Goodwill, they started dating, they um, went through Bridges Out of Poverty, which helped folks coming from generational poverty get a good understanding of why they're there, but if they wanna get out of it, what do they need to do? And so Leslie talks about that this program taught her how to pay not current bills, but past bills, and that was important to them. So they got debt free. Um, sometimes when we get cars donated to us, if they are in good shape, we will do uh, sealed bids out to employees so employees can purchase them. They got a car through Goodwill. And then during COVID, I was going over to check on, on the building that they are in because we had had somebody test positive. And as I was walking over there, they called me over because they wanted to show me they had their paper from the bank that authorized them and approved them to purchase a home. And so the house they're standing in is not a rental. It is their home. For five years, Leslie has been clean. She said, I can't ever imagine myself being in this place. And Goodwill has got to walk that journey with them for the past five years. I have chills. <laughs> I literally have chills from this story. I, this is this is the kind of impact that we are so grateful you are sharing with us because for the people you work with directly, they know that. For your people, for the people who work at Goodwill, they know that. For many of us, we don't know that. And to help people take that step up and to turn their lives around in such a profound way, right? And, and to, and to be, be part of a member of the community is so powerful. So, and I saw that comment come up in chat. So I agree. Thank you so much for, for sharing that story. They, they're why I come to work every day. The story, their story and so many others that we have. You know, and I know Karen and I can relate to that. We often talk as professors that it's all about our students. And for you, I think that the, the, uh, the motivation is, sounds like it's similar. Yeah. yeah, so powerful. My heart is so full just thinking about that. And it's not my first time hearing the story. <laughs> you know, it's just, wow. Debbie, I um, think it's just mind blowing and I'm glad that you were really able to kind of unpack all of the tentacles that Goodwill has in the community. And I think it's dizzying to think about all of the work you do in all of the different arenas, but also I think it's part of what makes you such an effective uh, president and CEO. Like when I think of Debbie Koval, I think of someone who really is leading a purpose driven life. And to me, that means it's almost seamless between sort of what you do and who you are. And that often involves our families. 
So as folks who know me well know, I do a lot of work with nonprofit organizations. And when they say, what does your husband do? I say, he's a truck driver. He can <laughs> hang a mean pipe and drape. He can get through Party City in oh. like nobody's business. And so I know it's impossible in this space to imagine that your family and your spouse mm -hmm. is not also kind of working for the nonprofit, albeit uncompensated. You shared a story with Larry, uh, with Lori and I that had almost a fairy tale like quality <laughs> about you and your husband and how Goodwill has played such a central role in your lives from the very beginning. Would you care to share that story with our audience? Sure. So back when I started out as a store manager, um, I was 30 years younger, right? And one of the wonderful things about being a store manager are for a lot of your customers, you are part of their social network. And so we have a lot of folks that come in daily basis, weekly basis, and you get to know them. So that was the case of this young of this woman who decided that this single gal needed a guy in her life. And so as she got to know me, she brought a list of five guys. Two were her sons, um, complete with information about them, the whole nine yards. <laughs> and so then one time when she came in, she and her husband had just bought a new car. So she had me go out, see the car, meet her husband. And um, for whatever reason, her husband liked me, told her son, you ought to give that girl a call. And so um, Tony gave me a call, but it had been several weeks had passed by through all this. So I'm like, who is this Tony Coble? And so at work one day, I remembered it and we laughed because it was a half off day. So going against everything I was raised in, I called a guy. And because growing up, I was not allowed to call guys. And so we went out on a date for lunch and a year later, we got married and we will celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary in July. And so what I tell people is you can find anything at a Goodwill store, including a husband. <laughs> Congratulations on your Thank 30th you. So clearly, Debbie, as Karen talked about, and obviously as we hear your story, your family has an up close and personal view of what it's like to be Debbie Coble the boss, <laughs> the boss. And so let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, we like to hear, Karen, I like to hear that. And we know that the people who are on this, on this um, call like to hear that as well. How important is that persona to you in general? And as I say, as I kind of prompt you on this, I, I, I want to share with you, you know, we, you and I briefly talked at the beginning that, and some of you may know that I have spent 30 years at Purdue Northwest mentoring young women. Um, and it, it's kind of my thing. Um, and people know me for this. I, I'm the faculty advisor for women in business. I've mentored young faculty, but also you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of students. So that idea of girl boss <laughs> appeals to me. So can you kind of talk about um, how important that persona is to you and, and how you play those roles? So, yeah, so it's, you know, you have two different worlds, right? You have your work life and you have your home life. Um, but I think we all know that, especially for us females, it is not possible to walk away from one or the other. And so I love a book that's called um, Women Are Like Spaghetti, Men Are Like Waffles. And the premise is, as women, we are just so noodled, right? And you don't know where one noodle starts and the other noodle ends. And, and that's me. And so um, as I, you know, I have to be intentional sometimes at home to leave work at work and home at home, but it's who I am. Um, goodwill is, it's, it's a part of me. And so it doesn't stay at work, but home doesn't stay at home either because I'm a wife, I'm a mother, um, one day, hopefully a grandmother. And those are all very, very important pieces. And so sometimes the boss comes in a little bit more at home than it probably should. But sometimes at work, Mama Coble shows up. And um, when I'm working with folks in a way that probably would give HR a few concerns when I'm coming along some, beside somebody. So those are things that are just, they're very important. And my kids are the greatest advocates and my husband for goodwill. If somebody starts to say something um, 
not so kind about it, they are at, they are at my defense and they, they make sure that they have correct information. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's so powerful when our families get involved, as Karen talked about, and as you so eloquently talked about. I want to transition us to something that, um, given my background in mentoring young women, I I'm hoping you can share with us because you, you know, I have the opportunity to do this for women who are at university. You have the opportunity and you've started a program to do this for women in different circumstances. And I think, you know, it just spoke to my heart. And um, so I think you do more than just, you're not just, you don't walk the walk about, uh, the talk the talk about being girl boss. You walk the walk and you're helping other people to get where you are. Um, so that was a setup for, I think you know where we're going, but I hope you will share that story with us. Yeah, so um, girl boss. In November, we were looking for an opportunity for a group in our church to do some community service um, activities. And it's, they were young families, so that, of course they wanted to do it with other young families and children. Well, given the pandemic, we just couldn't find any place. And so we have a program where we are actually working with kids in the school that are at risk at um, possibly being attracted to the gangs and those kinds of things. And so I went to our director, Director Lee of that program, and I said, hey, Kenneth, what do you think? So on a Friday night, we brought two very diverse worlds together at Goodwill, and we had family night, and we played games, and we ate food, and as I was greeting the kids coming in, Kenneth was introducing me and saying, you know, she's my boss, and, you know, not just the boss of this facility, but of all at Goodwill. And so on the way home, one of the little girls was just so intrigued by me. And she was asking questions and she said, I've never met a girl boss before. And so Kenneth was texting me this on Friday night after the event. And this was just something that really stuck in my heart. And for young girls not to have any knowledge of what women can truly be, and so as he and I have talked more about this and spent time with it, his wife who is, so Kenneth wears a lot of hats. He's also a minister and he and his wife co-minister. Mm -hmm. So the female Reverend Lee and I are partnering together to start this initiative called Girl Boss in Training. And we are gonna be starting it, launching it in June, working with junior high and high school girls to give them the idea of what it means to be not just a girl boss, but the woman that they have the potential of being and introducing women into their lives that can be mentors and can give them exposure to opportunities they have never had before. I am just so excited about this opportunity. You know, I love this story and, and you know, it's, it, it gets tossed around, but I'll say this representation matters. Mm -hmm. It matters. It matters that people see you as the big girl boss, right? <laughs> and I, you know, you know, the, the big boss, and she's a girl, you know, and, and it's, it matters that young women, even at the uh, middle school level can see you and other women that I'm sure you'll be bringing in and say, I could do that. Why can't I do that? I can certainly do that. Um, and, and so I applaud this, I love this, and I love this story. And as we continue on, I want, before we move on, I just wanna take a moment to remind all of you that as Debbie's sharing these wonderful stories with us, we are a bit jumping between topics and there may be things that you're saying, wait, I have a question. And we want to hear those. We want to give you a chance to ask your questions. So please either put them in the chat in Zoom or feel free to put them in the comments on Facebook Live and we will get to those. Uh, we, will, we certainly have time reserved for Debbie to answer your questions and we know that you have them. So um, please make sure you do that. Well, I'm just thinking like girl boss and train. I want the t-shirt. Like I can already, like, I want to be a GBIT or whatever that means. There's going to be a t-shirt. <laughs> I got to have the t-shirt. And you know, what's really, um, Dawn in the chat says, you know, transformational leadership and what a great example you are, Debbie, um, as, you know, as a steward and steward leadership at work. 
What I really love about the program is that you're starting with middle school students, and I think you can't start too young. And so planting that seed early is just amazing. Really excited to see where that work, how that work blossoms. I want to shift gears just a little bit because I'm always keeping an eye, of course, on the third sector and what's happening. What are the trends in philanthropy? What's happening with giving? And when COVID hit, um, I, I panicked. I just thought, you know, even in the best of times, nonprofits have issues with scrutiny, with um, employee, high employee turnover. And I thought, what will the impact of COVID be? you know, on, on philanthropy and giving. So you've shared a lot um, about Goodwill, but I'm wondering if you could just take us a little deeper and talk about the impacts of COVID on the Goodwill model and operations. Sure. So I will tell you right now, I get daily store sales, because as we said, store sales are our strongest um, funding source. And so back in that day in March, when we were told the world was shutting down, um, it was probably the hardest day of my career. We told about 650 people they were out of work and they were gonna be laid off because we had no other option. Now, what we did, we did a couple things though with that. One is that because for a lot of our folks, this was the first time they had ever experienced anything like this whether they were our hourly folks or our staff folks, you know, they had never experienced this. So we worked with them on company time to apply for unemployment and were there to answer questions. And then we have a really unique position here at Goodwill called success coach or dream coach. And they are really there kind of as case managers for the employees. And so our success coach or dream coach, her job during COVID was to be that liaison to our employees as they had questions, concerns, needs, those kinds of things. And then we got really good at doing videos. And so we were sending out videos to everybody on their home address, email address, their, their Goodwill email address to try to keep um, communications going. And so for us, our greatest fundraising is our stores. So during the time we were shut down, we dropped two million dollars and so that had a huge impact on us now we're very blessed because we run a very tight organization and so we had a rainy day fund and, and obviously we've come out on the other side of it um, some of our private donations were affected but we have never relied as much on that as other organizations um, so they were affected some but they're coming back. Um, and so those were really how we were impacted. But a silver lining in that was we were trying to figure out what could we do for the community. So I got a hold of my board chair who works for one of the local health systems. And I said, Tracy, we don't have any money, but what can we do to help? Because we were thinking make masks, everybody was making masks, right? Mm -hmm. So she put me in, char in connection with her purchasing um, staff and they said, we need isolation gowns. So in less than three weeks, we had a new business up and running, making isolation gowns for the hospital. It was funded by one of our local banks, Foundation, uh, First Source. And so they, they gave us the money to get that started. So we were able to help the community and start a new business line, which will be a training program. So that's a full circle moment. That's really amazing. And you know, uh, before we move on, I'll just jump back there because there's so many lessons um, in, in what you just shared. But I, I want to specifically say something about the videos because rumor has it that there was Debbie on a video <laughs> doing a thing that Debbie doesn't typically do publicly. <laughs> so yes, I, I did. Um, I told her this was a one-time thing. <laughs> But when we got news of when we were going to get to call everybody back, yes, I did a happy dance video. <laughs> and I had employees talking about that for quite some time because that was a side of me they just don't normally see. But I was just so, I cannot tell you how great it was to start seeing more employees. Now, we did have some employees that stayed working the whole time. 
because we kept our donation centers open. We had e-commerce going. We had our industrial services division still going. Um, but that was a small fraction of the total number because usually we have about a thousand folks on payroll at any one time. Our schools had all gone virtual, you know, the whole nine yards. And so when I got to see people walking, more people walking through the door, it was just so wonderful. That's amazing. And your second pro chance program stayed yes. open. So, yeah. yep, our group violence intervention, where we are actually working with um, members in the gang community, trying to help them get out of that lifestyle, that stayed boots on the ground the entire time, because that's not a group that's going to go virtual with you. Some of our other programs did go virtual. Um, we saw less folks coming through, obviously, but that one, that team just stood the test of time in what they did working with the community. So I'm going to transition, Debbie, and I'm going to take the opportunity to um, ask one of our questions, but also tie in a question we've seen um, come, we've had come in. Um, and that is, you're a girl boss, but what are the <laughs> challenges and opportunities that come with managing in what is still for a large part of man's world? Oh. Yeah, so you know it has its challenges, but it also has its um, moments of opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it, um, all the research shows, and we know men and women tend to lead differently. It's not necessarily that one's right, one's wrong, they are just very different. And so sometimes you can have challenges if you're, if you're in more of the male dominated arena, bringing in the female style can be a little bit of a challenge. And so you really need to work to bring, bring that approach in so that it's acceptable, but to also you know, let them know that, hey, I'm here and I'm here to stay. <laughs> and so you know, I think that's kind of the approach that I've had. I've not ever, I'm not one that comes in full force with those kinds of things. I kind of probably worm my way in. Um, and do it on a more gentler style. But that's kind of my personality too. It's kind of how I manage people and lead people. Um, and so from that aspect, it has been a work in progress. Um, sometimes I do get frustrated because I feel like that as a female, I'm not listened to, um, but that just means then that I need a different approach and I need to figure out how I'm going to be listened to. So I love this because it transitioned exactly where I was gonna go and that is one of the things that you told us when we first talked was about uh, sometimes not getting taken seriously. And so you sort of, you touched on that here uh -huh. uh, about being a woman, but there was a particular part about being a woman that you touched on. And um, I will say that since we've been, we've all been home, my high heels have been gathering <laughs> dust in the closet um, and it oh. relates to this part about being taken seriously so can you uh can you share that please sure so for those who don't know me i'm a whole five foot and a half inch tall and i have to put the half inch because as a child i was rather ill and my mother literally prayed that i would hit five foot so i'm five foot and a half inch so i have to put that in there um <laughs> And I'm not, I, I'm a small boned, small statured woman. And so that in and of itself sometimes can create challenges. And so um, I was kind of laughing the other day, we actually, through our group violence inter intervention, we were doing a peace walk um, in a neighborhood that has just seen a lot of violence. And so I was standing next to the chief of police from South Bend, who's like 6'3". And I wasn't in my heels that day. So I'm looking up at him and as we're talking and, um, and he's kind of looking down at me. But sometimes being smaller in stature can create problems because you can be, it's easier to talk over, it's easier to overlook. Um, and so there's just times that I have to gauge my assertiveness to, to counter that. It doesn't happen as much now that I've established myself in my role, but in the beginning, it really, to the point, and, and I share this with both of you, when we were figuring out my office, we literally picked furniture that didn't dwarf me because a lot of office furniture can. And so that was just one of the things that I knew I needed to be ready for as we move forward and I began this new adventure. 
Yeah, and this is this is a yet another good example of representation matters, right? That you don't have to be six feet tall, right? You know, you yeah. just don't. And but there are things that you need to do to this is just part of who you are. And so I'm going to pull in one, I'm going to take a moment of privilege and pull in one question from the chat because I think it relates really nicely here. And that is, as a leader and as a girl boss, right, um, specifically, how have you built a good team around you? Because you, we all know no, no man or woman is an island. Um, and what advice would you give others on how to build a cohesive team? Sure. So one of the things when, when I made the transition into my new role, um, I didn't have anybody on my executive team jump ship. Everybody stayed. And so, and we had kind of slowed down as an organization. We weren't moving at a pace we had in the past. And so everybody was ready to get moving again. And so um, I had full buy-in from them and we moved forward. Now, as time went by, I had folks retire. I've had one person choose to leave to go to another employer. But as I replaced individuals, um, you know, one of the biggest things is, do you buy into what we're doing? And are you willing to serve folks in the way that we are, we are serving people? And so those are the things that are, that are very important. Bringing in individuals with different viewpoints is also important. And so as we continue to look at that, um, I'm blessed with a long tenured staff, but the folks that I've had the opportunity to bring into, I have really made sure that they are willing to row in the same direction that we are but also bring in new ideas. And um, when I hired my CFO, you know, before she, we hired her, um, she had a conversation with me and she said, Debbie, I'm a disruptor. Does that work? And I said, that works. And so, you know, she has come in and she has made some incredible changes. And my, you know, my um, chief human resource officer, same thing. I wanted somebody to help me lead and change our culture and bring in the services that we give to the clients that we serve, I wanted to pour into our employees like we had never done before. And she was right there with me. And so together, this whole executive team, um, we've just been able to, to work together and to grow together and be able to be the organization that we know we can be. Yeah, so it's not about, it's not about everybody following your lead, it's about everybody following your vision. Yes. And, con and contributing in their own way to that and being able to say, Debbie, I have an idea. Mm -hmm. it, it's not exactly what you wanted to do, but what do you think? <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I think that's a powerful lesson for those of us that are, um, that are working in positions where we can Im impact and influence others. So I love that story. Thank you so much. I would just say, heaven knows, we don't want any more than one Debbie in this organization. That's all I'll say. <laughs> well, it reminds me of a quote that says, you know, which way, uh, uh, who are you? Who are you? And it's like, I'm the boss. Did you see which way my team went? You know, <laughs> they're the folks that were running like, you know, three miles ahead. And that takes a special brand and a special, a very confident leader, I think, to be able to, um, accept that kind of sometimes, you know, some a different of opinions and different perspectives. So we want to make sure, Debbie, first of all, that you know how much love there is for you in the chat. Folks are really, really enjoying this conversation. So we can't thank you enough for being, again, so authentic, so transparent, because it really has been um, a riveting conversation. And we want to make sure that we encourage folks again to post your questions in the chat. There are some that we, we want to make sure that we leave ample time to get to, but there's at least one or two questions yet that are sort of burning that Lori and I have to get to. And one, because I, I swear I'm going to pass out <laughs> every time I think about this story. Um, in fact, a prime truck just, Amazon truck just left my, <laughs> my driveway. So if you don't know the name Mackenzie Scott, you may not recognize it, but she is the ex-wife of um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon and really an angel investor in the philanthro venture capital kind of world. And she is known for making very large, unrestricted and mostly unexpected gifts. 
And word on the street is, Debbie Coble, Goodwill Industries of Michiana, that there was some communication from Mackenzie Scott. Spill the tea. <laughs> okay. Well, I have to say it was indirect because she will not communicate directly with those folks. So um, along late October, early November, I get this email and it simply says, there's an investor who wants to invest in you. Please contact me. Only thing missing was the Nigerian prince in this email. <laughs> so I deleted it. Um, because I have a really good IT department who trains us to delete all those suspicious emails. So a week or two later, this email shows up again. I delete it. And then, um, so then another organization emailed and said, you really need to talk to this person. This is legit. So my vice president of community engagement, I said, hey, guy, will you contact them and find out what's going on? So he does. And he goes, Debbie, they won't talk to me you have to get a hold of her. So I'm digging through my deleteds and I find her and I, I get a hold of her and we have this conversation. And she's telling me about Mackenzie Scott and she gives me information. I don't know the amount yet. Um, never asking for anything than other public information. So I'm not overly concerned at this point. Went and checked everything she told me, it all checked out. And so then we get to the point of there is going to be a donation. But see, the whole thing through this time, they said, you can't tell anybody. This needs to be secret. This needs to be, you know, Mackenzie doesn't like to have this out there. So I finally got a hold of my board chair because, and I fully expected her to say, stop. But I decided if this thing went south, I wasn't going by myself. <laughs> and so then the actual funder came in of the, the nonprofit um, foundation that would be supplying the money came in. So I'm realizing that if this is a scheme and a scam, it's pretty elaborate and it would be hard to bring three different entities to this complexity. So I finally get a hold of my CFO and I bring her into the picture. And so we had it set up. We let our bank know that this donation is going to be coming in. And if they can kind of keep an eye on our account, we would greatly appreciate it. And so then on a Monday, I get the notice that the transfer has happened and there is $10 million in our account. And the whole thing about this is we never talk to anybody. So Mackenzie Scott has individuals out there that she sends out to do all this covert investigation work. And then when she deems that the organization is, is the one that she wants to contribute to, then this is how she does it. And so um, we have to report on how we use this money for the next three years. And you're right, there are, you know, the, the only restrictions are the, you know, no lobbying, no fixing elections, no one person can benefit from it. And outside of that, she has said, you run the organization, you have a great leadership team, why should I tell you what to do with it? And which is just great. And so we have launched, you know, we have designated some of it. The board has decided we will only use this for mission purposes. And so we have launched into listening tours throughout our territory. Uh, we're getting some scheduled over in Northwest Indiana and in the Southern part of North Central Indiana and in, in, in Central Indiana, Central Northern Indiana to listen to community leaders about what are the needs given what Goodwill does, how can we best utilize these funds to make an impact we're going to hold some back and invest that and then use the um, the revenues from the investment so that this fund doesn't just go away very quickly. Um, but we're in the process of doing right that right now. And then we'll have a plan of what we want to do based upon what we heard. Who can we partner with? Who can help make this $10 million, $15 million, $20 million? I mean, you think about the impact we can have in communities if we can get partners to come alongside of us and say, we want to be a part of this. And so we're just, we're pretty excited about it. You know, I think this is, a, the passion that you just spoke with is incredible. And there was a, a lovely question that came in chat and I, I, I can't help but she asked this question now. And they ask, how did you find your purpose? Right, you speak so passionately. How did you find your purpose? And the other part of this was, how do you suggest the rest of us find our purpose? Um, you know, I love people, first of all. And my mom talks about when I was little, um, I was always a fixer. 
And so whenever there was a problem, I just felt I had to fix it. And so sometimes that caused me some problems because I probably should have gotten help fixing some problems before they got me into a little bit of trouble, but that's kind of by nature who I am. And so, and as we talked in that, that time before all this, you know, I expressed to both of you, my faith is a very important part of my life. And so I honestly, I honestly look at my work as also my ministry and where I'm supposed to be. Um, there are times that I miss doing direct services with people, but in the role that I am in now, I have the opportunity to create those visions and to get folks to come alongside and we can help more people to greater extents than we could if it was just Deb Coble doing it one-on-one. -on -one. And so um, I think I was very fortunate in finding my passion. It just fits my personality. It's who I am. And I will tell everybody, I have the best job in the world and I just can't see myself doing anything else other than this. Debbie, you've inspired so many people. Um, I, I can't tell you, I know that folks will be having and repeating this conversation for, for months on end. Um, in fact, you've inspired so many folks, people really want to know. They're saying things in the chat, like let's move mountains together, Debbie. Um, and they want to know, how can they get involved in the Girl Boss Training Program? Yeah, so we're gonna do the, we're gonna do the pilot um, starting in June. And then if that, you know, once we get some of those bugs worked out, then we will be looking at expanding it. Um, and so I don't know that I actually have the answer to that yet, but we definitely don't want to keep it in South Bend. We want to move it throughout because there are so many girls that can benefit from this. So I guess at this point, I'd have to kind of say, stay tuned, um, but please keep in contact with me if you're interested, because, you know, this is not something any one person can do alone. It, it is going to take a village and it's going to take women in great roles to be able to speak to these girls to help demonstrate what they have the capability and the power to do. So I wanna make sure that people continue to ask their questions. They keep coming in and Karen and I are making sure that we keep asking them. But as Karen said, there are, there are a few things that we desperately want to ask you. And I have one last one that I really desperately want to ask you. And that is, you, you know, the name, the title of this program is Breaking the Glass Ceiling, and clearly you are. You are a glass ceiling breaker. And not only are you breaking them, but your reach is being felt so broadly, right? You talk about, the, you know, the intersection of your faith and your work. Um, so I want to read you a quote, and then I'm going to ask you to respond to that um, as a glass ceiling breaker um, and as somebody kind of leading the way. And that is this, that to, you know, it has been said that today's broken glass ceilings are tomorrow's stepping stones. So I would like to hear from you and maybe you can share with the rest of the wonderful women on this program, what would you like to see women create in their lives, in their communities, for other women, for the world? What, how, how can we change broken glass ceilings into stepping stones? Sure. You know, I think one of the things is, first of all, as females, we need to be more confident in who we are. Um, you know, we, we tend to shy away from some of those kinds of things. And, you know, there's, there's a fine line between confident and cocky, you know, but I think for a lot of us, we're so afraid of moving over that line into cocky that we don't demonstrate the confidence that we have in our abilities to, to do what we know we can do. Um, and so I guess as I think about, you know, glass becoming stepping stones, that is something that we all need, if that's something that we struggle with, we need to work on it to, to be able to demonstrate the confidence and that it is okay to be a confident female leader. And so we need to mentor those coming in behind us that it is okay to do that. And you need to do that. And as we break glass ceilings, that really just paves the way for those coming in behind us to be able to break that next glass ceiling and to be able to do things greater and better than we've ever done them. And so unless we're willing to pave that way in that manner um, and to help make those connections and to provide that mentoring tool, it makes it difficult for those that, that really want to do that, 
but haven't had the training or the exposure that they can do that. So ladies, I think Debbie just threw down the gauntlet to all of us and I love it. And it's consistent with GBI, I'm gonna call it GBIT. I love that, GBIT. It's consistent with that, that we have an obligation, no matter, you know, whether we're CEO or wherever we are in the, you know, in the corporate ladder to reach down and help those you know, who are on their way up and show them what it means. Debbie, can you give us an example of, you know, what it means to be confident, um, where that line is for you? Yeah. Well, I can, I guess I can give you an example of where I was seven years ago. <laughs> and so um, when the board was actually doing the search and um, of course I had the first interview and I had a migraine that day. And so for those of you who suffer migraines, you understand I was not at the top of my game. But because I had always contributed every success to my predecessor, when I did my interview, I kept referencing back to Larry. And, you know, and so the recruiter that we were working with after that first interview, she came into me and she said, Debbie, they're concerned whether you can lead without Larry or not. And I mean, that was a very difficult moment for me, right? Um, so as I went into the second interview, it was so hard for me to say, I did this or the team and I did this, but I knew I had, it was a very hard lesson that I had to learn right away. And I think as, you know, we never want to take credit from anybody for what they did. And there's, so there's that very fine line. But we also have to be okay with saying, I did this. And so it, you have to get yourself out of the comfort zone and practice it in order to be able to do it. I, I love this story more than I can tell you. Um, <laughs> because I've seen so many young women um, and colleagues and peers right, do exactly what you described in that interview. Oh, it's all because of so-and-so. You can claim credit for the things that you did and you should. And I really appreciate you being so honest with your own story um, and inspiring all of us to do that. I, it's more important as I work with all these young women, it's more important than you know to hear somebody like you say that. So, so we I, just want to remind folks that this really is your time. The balance of time we have is for you to continue placing your questions in the chat um, and, you know, soaking in all of this amazing Debbie Cobleness, if we can coin that phrase today. <laughs> um, so here's a question that has um, come up, and, and this is kind of um, part of just the national conversation. And that is the fact that there are a lot of folks who say we are actually in the middle of several pandemics. We've got the health crisis with COVID. We have an economic uh, crisis with so many people being displaced and out of work, which you spoke so passionately and eloquently about a little while ago. And then of course we have all of the issues with racial and social justice that are um, you know, dominating the media cycle. I'm wondering where Goodwill is with issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we are, we are a work in progress, like a lot of places, right? And so we, we have it top of mind that we want to make sure that we are providing equal opportunities for, for everybody. Um, one of the things with the, I mentioned um, hiring in our new chief human resource officer that is one of the things that we really want to take a look at is how do we, we want to help folks get the training and get the knowledge that they need to be able to move up in the company. But here's the other thing that we talked about. Not many companies talk about that. And we're like every other company. We have over a hundred job openings right now because we cannot get people, we can't even get people to apply right now. And I know we are like every other business, but what we have said is we want to help everybody live their life most abundantly. And so if your life most abundantly isn't within the walls of goodwill, we want to help you get the training and the resources that you need 
to make that next step, even if it's outside of goodwill, to be the best that you can be. And so we kind of take a, a broad view of that um, to really try to provide individuals with those opportunities that they want to take advantage of so that they have what they need to be um, a player in the field of where they want to go. I, I really appreciate and respect the way you said that because I think sometimes it's easy to kind of distill this conversation down to we need a person who looks like this and a person who looks like this and a person who looks like that and then we've checked the boxes. But it really, and then other folks think, oh, well, you know, if we're hiring with that kind of strategy, um, then are we compromising quality or credibility in some ways? But what I take away from your response, Debbie, is diversity of thought and perspective and opinion is just as important um, as some of these other milestones and, and hurdles that we, need to, that we need to meet. So thank you for that. A very complex issue. So there's, we're almost, we're getting very close to time and we want to respect the time of everyone here. We appreciate that you've taken what might be your lunch hour to join us. Um, and I, I want to make sure that we ask you this one question that, um, that has come up and it's a seemingly simple question, but after a year of COVID, um, maybe it's not. And that is, how do you get through a tough day or a tough season or a tough year? You know, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about how hard it was for people to get, and this isn't really a COVID question, um, but there's been a lot, there was a lot of discussion about how hard it was for people to get into figuring out how to live with COVID and how hard it's gonna be for people to get out. But this has been a time unlike any other in all, most of our lifetimes. I, you know, I'm not sure every, who's on the, on the call with us, but how do you deal with those tough days, those tough seasons, those tough years? Sure. So there's probably three or four different things. Um, one again, I'm gonna mention it is my faith um, that plays just a very, very strong piece of it. And the second one is I get to come home to my husband every day and um, as we, you know, we walked into the world just recently of being empty nesters. And um, I have to tell you, I'm, you know, you never know what to expect with that. And so um, I have, we talked about, you know, husbands are part of the workforce when you join a not-for-profit. So yes, my husband even painted little buses for me one time. And so um, I have a haven to come home to. And so between him and my doggie, and then I have, even through the, through the pandemic, I maintained a workout schedule. Um, for me, that's just a very important part of my life. Um, I tend to work out six days a week. And so keeping that going, because that's a stress reliever, it's time that I do, you know, I listen to my Bible or I listen to my mess, you know, this, the podcast that I listen to in that arena. And so those three things have really, and then my, my kids, um, they are such a joy and an important part of my life and my parents and my in-laws. And so if you put all those things together, family, faith, working out, um, and then the great team that I have here at Goodwill, that's really what got me through the, the past year. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, I, I love this answer. There's no magic bullet. No, there's not. But it is the important fundamentals as you talked about. Um, so, I, I want to give you one, before we turn this back over to Alicia, I want to give you, I, we know that there's some important things happening at Goodwill. Um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it involves a little black dress. Absolutely. And it's not my husband wearing the little black dress. He's not that involved. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we normally do two little black dress events a year. And they are our fundraisers that we do, um, but they're really more friend raisers and mission um, explainers. So tomorrow, because we still in St. Joe County, we still can't bring large crowds together. Tomorrow at noon, 1130, um, we are launching fa on Facebook Live, the little black dress. And so um, I have been told that this is like little black dress meets QVC. And so you're going to be able to purchase not only clothing that will be modeled, um, but also you'll be introduced to our world of Shop Goodwill, which is our online business. And so you'll get to see other things other than clothing. We're going to do that for three weeks in a row. 
Um, but, and I, and I don't have the date right off the top of my head, but in the fall, we are planning on Northwest Indiana's Little Black Dress event live and in person. So you all, we'll get that out just as quickly as possible once we confirm that date. Um, and I expect to see everybody there for a wonderful time. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Debbie. And Stephanie has actually added the link for our attendees in the chat. Um, in the spirit of channeling Andrea Pearman, I'm just going to say and invite everyone who's attending today to turn their cameras on. Part of what has made this Breaking the Glass season, sealing season and Niwa so important during this time has been able to just see each other and connect. And so we thank you for this opportunity on behalf of Lori and I and Breaking the Glass Ceiling. It's been an amazing, amazing season. Turning it over to Alicia now, take us home. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, all of you ladies. Uh, uh, make sure you follow Niwa on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And don't forget the Influential Women Awards Banquet on September 30th. 2021. You can get your tickets at nwiiwa.org. Thank you all for attending. Thank you all and goodbye. We hope Bye. to see you in the fall. Bye everyone. Thank you all. Bye.